My name is Shauna Sylvester and I'm the director of the Center for Dialogue and it's delightful to have you here today. I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. And I also want to acknowledge that Carbon Talks afternoon, these lunch uh, hour sessions are possible from support from the North Growth Foundation and from our partner PICS, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. So in addition to those of you that are here, there are people uh, also connected to us through webcast. And I want to let people know there's a couple of ways that you can ask questions. There's is always a dialogue portion to what we do so I will recognize people here as you as you want to ask questions but I will also go to those on Twitter and so if you are tweeting your question it's hashtag carbon talks hashtag carbon talks well I am thrilled to be leading this session today and getting us started on district energy. District energy is something that Carbon Talks has been working with the city of Vancouver and has been looking at for years and also worked with the uh, city of Calgary on. So it's an issue that it's not new, but it's increasingly important, particularly as we look at GHG reductions in our cities and what, 50 53, 54% of our GHG emissions come from buildings. So district energy is a really important part of the whole um, transition to a low carbon economy. And we have two wonderful people with us today uh, to help us understand uh, the whole discussion about the role of the private sector in district energy. And today we have Trent Berry, he's the principal for Reshape Strategies and the chair of Creative Energy Canada Platform Corporation. So Trent, now neither Trent nor Hart want long introductions. So I'm not gonna give long introductions, but I am gonna say that I've known Trent for years. I've known Trent um, is somebody that has worked in the energy sector for years and years and years. And his, his depth of understanding and under, of district energy is very, very deep. And he was also very helpful with uh, creative services uh, gaining the, the um, contract locally for the um, central heat in Vancouver. So, Trent is going to be followed. Trent's going to go up first, and then Hart uh, Star Crawford is going to speak. Now, I heard about Phoenix Energy so many times across Canada and in other jurisdictions. I couldn't believe it. Everybody kept saying, have you heard of Phoenix Energy? Have you heard of Phoenix Energy? So it was so great to sit down with Ed, their CEO, and talk a little bit more about Phoenix. And I'm so thrilled that Hart Star Crawford can be with us today. He leads the project development and implementation in Phoenix Energy. And he managed the design and installation of the world's first geo-exchange retrofit in an occupied high-rise. Talk to them about how they do their drilling in very dense places. Um, I, I'm going to keep it short as promised. So each person's going to have 10 minutes. For those of you, how many of you have been to a Carbon Talk before? So you know we're pretty brutal on time. Um, and, that, and, and the reason that we are that way is so that there is real opportunity for you to ask questions. So think about your questions and in about 20, 25 minutes time we'll be back to you for the dialogue portion. Over to you Trent. Thanks. Uh, I think I'm mic'd, so. So thank you. Um, I always struggle with this definition of private versus public. So how do you switch to it? Oh, yeah. there you go. Um, so um, how many people from the, what they consider public sector? Oh, small. So that means by default the rest of you are private sector or unidentified, <laughs> undecided. Okay, well, I struggle with those definitions, and um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave you with, I think, three key or simple messages that, you know, district energy is, in my view, public infrastructure. I've worked on it from cities' perspectives, and I've worked on it from private developer perspective. But regardless of how we cut it and deliver it, it's public infrastructure, and I'll explain that in a second. Successful systems require partnerships. It doesn't matter whether it's the public or private sector. It is a partnership um, both ways. And regardless of the delivery model, and I'm going to uh, highlight that, a lot of what happens, I find, is that when we say, oh, the private sector can do it, then the public sector kind of goes to sleep and uh, leaves. And that's, that, it's not going to work. You're not going to get district energy implemented. Now, I'm going to start. We can get back in the conversation. I'm just starting from the premise that let's assume we've identified a business case or an opportunity for district energy, which means that there's private benefits and there's a bunch of public benefits. And I'm going to talk a little bit about delivery models. Why do I think that it's public infrastructure? Well. All infrastructure is what is a foundation of economic and well-being. You only have to look at the pictures of New York City after Hurricane Sandy. 
huge blackout. So all that infrastructure is hidden until something goes wrong. When it goes wrong, it goes terribly wrong. People had, didn't have power in Toronto for days over the Christmas break. So district energy is no different from electric, gas, sewer, water grids. They're capital intensive, they're shared, and they're very long lived. I studied in Europe, I just was back doing a tour of systems. Their systems have been in operation over hundreds of years. I mean, yes, they've renewed, but a lot of that infrastructure is very long lived. Um, the other reason I think it's public infrastructure is there's a mix of private and public benefits. Really simple. Private benefit, I get heat to my building. I don't need the public sector involved. I pay for that and I get it. Public benefits are things like greenhouse gas emissions or negative externalities or jobs or technology and innovation. Or increasingly, I think today, the conversation internationally is more and more about energy security and that is becoming a big conversation, whether it's earthquakes in Japan and New Zealand or storms back east, um, other exogenous events. We're starting to realize how precarious our systems are. And so that's part of the conversation is how do we internalize those security. The other reason it's public infrastructure is, you, you know, you build a factory, you can market your product around the world. You build a district energy system or infrastructure, it's tied to place. I can't pick that up and move it to another community. It is in that community and it's tied to the place. And then I won't get too technical, but it has characteristics of what we call natural monopolies and public goods. I'm just peppering with some things, hopefully, that will stimulate conversation. So I'm going to go fairly fast. This is um, a framework that I sort of, we developed that just kind of outlays our view of it's a continuum. There's no sharp line between public and private. So it's a continuum. At the very top of the continuum, you have 100% publicly owned and delivered. We have a great local example of Southeast Falls Creek, and that's an example that's inside a city department. We have another great local example of Lonsdale Energy Corporation, and it's actually a subsidiary of the city government. Both of those 100% public. The other really simple one, 100% private. I'm chair right now of Creative Energy, which is 100% private regulated entity. Other examples locally are University City, Corex, Fortis, all own uh, district energy systems. What I actually find really interesting is the middle space and what I call hybrid or shared ownership and government's models. Because you don't just need ownership, sometimes it's just shared governance. We get those kind of confused. So examples, not many examples of cooperatives and that's very unlikely with very capital intensive infrastructure, but there are a few. Um, concession agreements, uh, City of Richmond's actually working on a con concession style agreement. You can have split assets where one uh, private sector maybe owns generation and the, and the city owns distribution, for example. Um, N-Wave used to be an example of a, a public-private joint venture. It's been sold, so now it's 100% private. Um, and there's a few others there. So I don't want to belabor that, but that's just to give you a sense of the continuum. So regardless of whether it's delivered by the private sector or public sector, I like to separate out the conversation. There's a whole bunch of tools are supporting policies that cities have to bring to bear. I saw Chris Baber actually walk in from Southeast Falls Creek. Did I, oh, there, Chris. So Chris is here from Southeast Falls Creek in the city, and this is an example of a lot of what the city of Vancouver is looking at. If there are public benefits without owning, how do we internalize those public benefits in the business case? So leadership and co-development is really important. I have worked on business cases that were fabulous and went nowhere, and I've frankly worked on business cases that were very marginal and are built. <laughs> I won't tell you which ones those are. Um, but you know what the difference was? Leadership and vision. It doesn't matter how good the business case is. I've seen communities who fully just rejected stuff despite the business case, and I've seen others go forward despite, <laughs> frankly, a tenuous business case. So leadership, co-development, the dialogue, a lot of what Sean and her group is doing here, Franchises play a big role. I'm going to use an example of that. Load development tools. So these are things like how your green building policies align with district energy delivery. Mandatory connections. Coordination of planning. Um, so a good example in the city of Vancouver, there's a lot of talk about bringing down the viaducts that come into downtown. That's a big infrastructure project. Major change in the streets. Well, if you coordinated the installation of other infrastructure, it's kind of win-win. So that's an example of coordination. Taxation, property taxes, grants, and other financial tools, and lastly, land, like just finding land for some of these facilities. So I'm going to end with a brief case study, and then hopefully we'll get into some dialogue. So Creative Energy is a new company that uh, acquired Central Heat. Central Heat 
uh, serves about 200 buildings downtown. It was started by a group of, frankly, private visionaries, um, engineers and business people in the 60s when Vancouver gas was fairly new. And uh, to, to, to the environment, and uh, we, had, uh, we still had things like oil burners and some wood fire burners, so it was a very major improvement in air quality. And they started a system that includes things like St. Paul's and, and uh, BC Place. And uh, last year it was acquired and rebranded as Creative Energy. And I believe on the webinar, Stacey Bernier, the new CEO and president, is, is on the webinar. So um, what I want to talk about is a partnership that Creative Energy, uh, one of many that we're working on, but one that Creative has just completed with the city of Vancouver. Um, and it's for delivery of a new hot water system for the entire Northeast False Creek area. So this is the area on the north side of False Creek between sort of BC Place and the creek. You'll see that big hole next to BC Place where there's the hotel and we don't know what kind of development will be, a casino um, going in. But there's a whole bunch of new development going in that area. And so it's a significant new development note. We identified it as an opportunity for a, a collective shared low carbon district energy system. The city's using a few policy tools through the franchise like mandating connection. And as part of the agreement, creative energy has to deliver on certain outcomes. So just conceptually, I won't belabor this, the map, there's a core area, all that area of Northeast Falls Creek, it's all new development around BC Place. This is sort of BC Place there. And Creative Energy's existing steam plant is on the other side of that. And then Chinatown is also part of it, but Chinatown's more an infill style of development, so it's dealt with a little bit differently. So to end briefly, the nature of the agreement with the city is Creative Energy develops, owns, and operates all the infrastructure. It'll be hot water, not steam. That enables a whole bunch of things like different kinds of alternative energy, and it's more efficient. Um, there'll be mandated connections and extension tests. All the buildings will be hydronic. And it's separated into two phases. First, we leverage the existing plant. Then we implement a larger low-carbon solution. There's a number, including sewer heat recovery, that are being looked at. We have a greenhouse gas rider um, proposed. And again, all of this is subject to BCUC approval, which is the next step. We have milestones from the city that we have to meet and fallbacks. If we don't meet those, there's information sharing, coordination in the franchise agreement, and um, default and termination, which means the city can assume the system at some point if they so elected. So that's an example. I just wanted to pepper you with an example of a partnership model. And it's one of many. So I'll end there. Thanks. All right, my name is uh, Harsar Crawford. Uh, I'm from a company called Phoenix Energy. I'd like to give you a little bit of a background uh, in our company. I think it kind of explains our approach and where we come from. Um, and then I'll touch on the uh, role of private sector we've seen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we are a company that comes from uh, building design and construction professionals. So we kind of came out of this idea of uh, looking at building systems and growing out for them rather than, say, a district energy standpoint where you would look at having a central plant and then meeting a bunch of loads. And, and that really does reflect in, in where we came, uh, where we came from and what, where we're going. Uh, we wanted to start with uh, the word opportunity. It's a great place to start. Our company is about three years old. And this is the opportunity we started with. Uh, a lot of what you'll find uh, that we're targeting is, is based around this dense urban uh, area. And the reason we've done this is you have the, the biggest square footage, you have the highest energy use, and you have the most, uh, the most carbon use as well. And we figure if you're going to put your resources in and try and tackle a problem, um, this is where you want to go. When we looked at this dense urban core, we looked at um, you know, different ways to break it up. And we looked at the newer buildings. And newer buildings are typically larger. There's a really big energy consumption associated with them. But if you pull up those newer buildings, you still have you know, the rest of the picture right there. And, and what that says is that most of this energy consumption and most of this um, greenhouse gas emissions are associated with these existing buildings. And when we looked at them, we wanted to try and come up with a solution to, to tackle this. And we, we looked at these buildings as individual buildings to see what we could do, just kind of your typical retrofits. But then we also said we should look at these as, as a big set of existing buildings. What can we do for this, this set of existing buildings and how can we can tackle it? When we looked at the individual buildings, we kind of came up with uh, geothermal. We said, can we retrofit these buildings with geothermal? And the reason we did that is there's not a lot of opportunity to roll out 
you know, low carbon solutions in a denser, dense urban core. There's not a lot of land available, you know, there's not a lot of room for solar panels and wind, and we said, well, what would it look like if we put geo in there? All these buildings have ground underneath them, there's opportunity. We can use that ground as a thermal battery, you know, when you take the excess heat in the summer, put it in the ground, and when we need the heat back out, we'll pull it back out in the winter. So we figured that's a viable option, that's something we could actually see, we could crunch numbers, and, and it was something that could work in, in certain cases. We said, okay, well, what are we going to do when we uh, want to connect all these buildings together? And we started looking at that. And what we said is, okay, say if we had that energy right there, what, what, how are we going to connect all these together? What does it look like? So we, we coined the term network energy system. And what that is is it's taking that, that first geo plant that we built and then setting up an infrastructure around that. And that's looking at buildings that are in the same area, looking for a complementary load profile so that we can connect these buildings together and, and share that energy. And then also a load profile that would allow us to leverage that, that renewable energy asset that would be under one building and connect them all together. Um, what we found when we did this is we could start to get uh, really good you know, energy cases and really good economic cases to tile these buildings together and kind of tackle that opportunity that we saw when we started out. Now, we like to draw a distinction between macro versus micro. This is just our own terminology, but it's a way that we look at it. And when we think of traditional district energy, we would call that macro. That's, we're going to develop this whole big area. You know, this is our big long-term plan. We're going to have these kind of loads if we put in this type of system. And then you, know, you, you, you get it going, and then you slowly build out, and you fill in all the loads, and you have a nice, viable district energy system. We think that's an excellent model and a really good way to go. But it doesn't necessarily apply to every, every possible scenario. And, and it didn't necessarily make sense in the scenario that we were looking at. So what I just described is what we would call micro. And that's where we would do a thermal energy project in one location that kind of made sense. We do it with one building or maybe a couple buildings. And then from there, we would grow organically out of there. And so rather than you know, design our district energy system and bring online to meet it, we would have our little mini micro system going and then just bring on the loads as they make sense and add to that district energy based on what we had in the surrounding area. And that doesn't mean that you wouldn't, you know, if you were building a new building, you wouldn't necessarily tie into it and, and bring new buildings in. And you could definitely uh, you know, pick how you design that building to bring in a complementary load profile and make it better. But it's kind of like a bottom-down or a top-up approach. I want to give a quick example. So this is a project we just did at 777 Dunsmere. Um, it's actually kind of two buildings together. There's a uh, tower on top and then there's the mall underneath. And what we've done is we've connected those two buildings together and put a geo field underneath. We're sharing energy between them. Basic principle like I described, heat goes down into the ground in summer and then comes back out in the winter. Um, but what happens also is when we look at this building as a whole, they still have excess energy. All summer long, we're still dumping uh, energy out into, the, uh, out into the air, and this energy has the potential to connect somewhere else. So as we, you know, we did our initial analysis, we also looked at the surrounding buildings in the area and uh, you know, saw that there was poten potential to you know, connect together these complementary load profiles. So this building just finished in the last, uh, last month or so, so we're currently collecting all the energy data. And then once we get this real life energy data and see when we have our energy and what we can do with it, there's the opportunity to go out there and see what we can do and, and, and potentially bring on some new, uh, some new buildings. Another project that we're working on, this is more on the new construction, is uh, solo development. So this is four high rises that are being built in Burnaby. Um, each high rise is, is its individual parcel and each is building, being built on its own with its own mechanical system. But what we've done is we've looked at what happens when we interconnect them together. So although each building can operate on their own, when we connect them together, we can now take those opposing low profiles and share energy in between them. And also each one of the uh, first two phases which are currently under construction have geo fields underneath them. So is there an opportunity to leverage that geo field in one building and use it in the other if uh, you know, it's not currently being fully utilized? And so in this way, we've got our, uh, a locally sourced renewable uh, energy sources now being shared between these buildings. Uh, you know, right across the street is uh, Brentwood Mall. I think they're going to be building not, upwards of nine towers there, and that's just something that they can continue to connect in and grow out that way. Now, I'm going to kind of tie all this in and, and see what we've seen in the role of the private sector within uh, the projects we've been working on. Uh, you know, we've seen, and Trent touched on this, the private sector do absolutely every role possible in district energy. It can be completely done in the private sector, it can be, can, can be completely done in the public sector. Um, where we found is that uh, if there is a uh, viable business case, we definitely got a lot of interest and we, we have found that there's always the money available. 
So if the business case is there, there's always money available. So there's never really ever an issue of, of money when it comes to these type of uh, thermal projects. And the other thing that we've found is expertise. Um, you know, if a municipality has done one district energy system or two district energy systems, they've done one or two types. And there is really no magic bullet solution. There has to be the right solution for what you have going on. And so that expertise, you know, someone like Trent has looked at countless different energy systems, and up front, he can bring a lot of expertise. Uh, we've worked with some of the bigger utilities like uh, Dalkia Veolia, and they, um, you know, they own dozens and dozens of district energy systems. So when they come to a new project, they can call up their buddy who's halfway across the world and say, I'm doing the same type of district energy that we already have. What's it like operating? What are the lessons learned? What can we pull from it? And so we can see a lot of expertise can come from, from the private sector on these various different kinds of solutions because there really is a need for the, the right solution to fit. When it comes down to encouraging how to develop these, uh, we find flexibility and collaboration uh, really key roles in there. And when, when we talk about flexibility, we don't, uh, I mean, we mean technical flexibility, kind of like Trent was talking about how they're lowering down the temperatures and it's going to open up different options for fuel sources and hopefully move us towards more low carbon ones. We're also talking about flexibility on, on you, how you build the business cases, how you evaluate these projects, and then uh, flexibility on, on how they are actually developed. Um, and that ties into collaboration. We really find that uh, collaboration is key. It's getting all the people who are involved all together. And then working to structure these, these businesses and these projects so that everybody has a common goal and they drive towards it together. Um, I'll give you a few examples. When we did the retrofit, we walked up to Cadillac Fairview with a simple payback, and they want to see a simple payback of three or four years, and it was just never going to happen. Renewable energies don't have that kind of payback, otherwise everybody would be doing them, right? So we said, well, let's look at a different economic model. So we started looking at net present value. That immediately made it look better, but they still weren't happy with it. So we got into a kind of a bigger picture conversation. We said, you're going to be saving operating costs. And there's also, this is highly marketable. This is potential to help improve, uh, improve occupancy rates in your building, or maybe even across your portfolio. And those two numbers tie into how a building is valued. So all of a sudden, if they can now get a higher value out of their building, that, that really shifts the economics. You might get a value increase in your building that's higher than the cost of the whole project. And so when we started engaging in those types of conversations, we were able to, to find a lot more interest in the project and eventually come through and, and see this project build. With the new construction, um, say we talk about solo, Typically, developers want to build the cheapest building they can, right? That's how they make the most amount of money. The mechanical system is just like a line item cost that's on there. When, when they engaged the developer with a utility, that mechanical system transformed from a line item cost into a renewable energy asset. And what that asset does is it allows... Um, so what the asset does is it allows them to think in a long-term picture. Rather than just like the first upfront cost, they're looking at the full life cycle cost. Uh, the last form of collaboration we see a potential for are these energy co-ops. And uh, what this is, is if you have a building with a renewable energy asset and they've got that node started and there's some complementary low profiles, you could get a utility to come in and buy everything and run it all and sell in a traditional standpoint. But you could also bring the owners of those buildings together or partner with a utility and kind of form a co-op. And then that way, every time that you're bringing a new building in, they can join that co-op and they have a complementary low profile, which is going to help everybody out. And then that that has the potential to just push that business case forward. And what happens is everybody wins when you start bringing these extra buildings on. This is kind of the potential I see for where our focus is in this dense urban area. Um, there's potential across the board. If you were doing a single family home new development, it wouldn't look something like this. It would probably be heating only and something along those lines. But what we've learned is with the flexibility and options, um, and really kind of bringing together the collaborative approach. We think the potential for district energy across the board is, you know, it's just completely open and infinite. Thanks. Wow. Can you hear me? Is the... It's working, good. Great, okay, so let's get some questions going for our... I'm already seeing Keen, let's... Other questions? Here we go. Keen, did you want to start with the questions? Sure, this is just a question from Twitter, and um, it is, what is the role of institutions, schools, hospitals, military bases? Okay. Um, maybe I'll start, because I've worked on probably half a dozen systems with institutions, like Children Women's, UBC, SFU, um, non-elementary schools. So they're big loads. Um, my partner, uh, Gerard always calls them the LeBron James of district energy. <laughs> right? 
the famous uh, basketball player. So they're big loads. You think if you're building, I don't like the concept, but let's say you're building a mall, you want anchors. Well, it's the same thing with district energy systems. So those institutions are large anchors. But one thing everybody forgets, and one of the reasons I like to think about the district energy business case, if you look at single-owned institutions, like all the hospitals in this province, every university in this province has its own district energy system already. That's actually very telling of the business case because when there is no mixed ownership, they make a rational decision and they own and operate the entire system and they've, it's universally selected as collected systems. So they get the business case generally and they're very useful to, the, to, to building these systems. Hart, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I, I would reiterate uh, what Trent said there that um, even when what, what I was describing, looking for that first little project to start that node, it, it does have to be a uh, you know really energy intensive. It helps the business case along, and, and a lot of these institutional uh, projects can be like that, uh, and uh, they they can form a really good base for for going forward and, and expanding beyond them. And I think, uh, like Trent said, um, the why I, why we see it as such a universal solution is because this business case is very strong. You really do get economies of scale, and it is really about finding that that right solution. Now, whether that solution is uh, leveraging an existing infrastructure they have on there and potentially growing it, or uh, taking a, an outdated infrastructure and then renewing it and building into something else, uh, there's there's definitely potential there. I'm gonna go ahead. One, two, and three. Here we go. I have a question about finance. Here, sorry, I'm gonna actually have to. Okay this because we have webcast. Thank you. Uh, my question is about finance. Uh, you mentioned simple payback doesn't really work. Uh, I'd just like you to elaborate on the parameters of what doesn't work. Is it the bank requirement for a seven or ten year payback period or is it the life cycle of the mechanical equipment which may be 25 years? Could you elaborate on that please? Yeah. Um, uh, well, when we've looked at this kind of initial little node, um, we typically talk to people who own buildings, right? And what we find is most people want to see a three, four, five year type payback. Um, and that's just very simply the cost of the infrastructure and, and what it takes to roll over it. And there's good reasons that they have that. They might not know what's going to be going to be going on in, in 10 years. Maybe that building is going to be torn down in 10 years and they need it to pay back in five or something like that. Um, so it really is done case by case. Um, when we looked at, uh, when we got into the bigger conversation, they, they, I mean, the project didn't pay back in three years, it never did, but they, they relaxed it and looked at other options, and um, that's where, how we went forward on that. Well, I wonder if you could um, maybe elaborate philosophically how we never get a climate carbon solution. If we yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna, we've just got another, we've got three questions, and we'll come back if we, right. we get a chance. Hi, just a quick question. I'm interested in the interconnectivity between micro and macro systems and if there are ever like mutually exclusive, if you can discuss a little bit on that. Uh, I mean, from our viewpoint, definitely not. I mean, 777 Duns Dunsmuir is supplied heating energy from creative energy. Um, so the, uh, the, the recovery in the geo system is not designed to do 100% of the load. Um, when we first brought the project forward, there was a consideration of maybe putting boilers in. Uh, Cadillac Fairview met with Central Steam at the time, and they worked out a business deal where we'd be able to stay on uh, the steam. So there are complementary right now. There's the opportunity for it to grow out, uh, grow from there, and that building will, you know, the peak loads uh, will still be met by Central Steam. If I could just add to that, I think there's no technical issues. Yeah. Um, Talus Garden, which is being built around the corner, has a, a block scale system that's interca interconnected with creative and a data center. Um, it is designed to enable future introduction of geo exchange. It wasn't economic in the first phase. It didn't make sense because there was more excess heat year round, so you don't need a battery. <laughs> but what I would say about that is there's technical feasibility and there's economic feasibility. And you don't, so competition is really good. But there's a point for competition, and then there's a point where you get on. You don't have sunk investments competing with new investments. So that's where you have to get careful. And that's part of the role of government. That's why we have regulators. You don't, you don't um, sorry, and I look to the BC. You see we have some representatives <laughs> here. Um, that's why you have a regulator to look at, is this economically rational? Because if people are just avoiding sunk costs, uh, that's not in society's interests. We've got a real serious climate problem, and we don't have enough resources to be spending them on doing 
dumb things. So we have to look at it, but yes, there, there are lots of situations where these can be made economically compatible, um, but somebody has to look at it uh, with a big picture. Yeah, collaboration is definitely key there. Thank you. Uh, this is really exciting. Uh, uh, our strata is on district uh, energy from Central Heat, which is now creative. Um, I've got two issues with it and with furthering uh, this process. Uh, the first is our residents basically see the heat as free because it's included in their strata fees. And so they have no incentive to conserve energy. And so we have some, some who never turn on their heat, but others who keep it at full blast as, as high as they can all the time. Uh, can these systems, can a hot water system or a, a steam system be set up or retrofitted so that there are individual meters? That's the first. The second is we're dealing with a monopoly here. If we don't like creative, and if creative starts raising its prices, we don't have a choice. We are tied to you as long as this building exists. How does that get dealt with? Because that's not healthy economics. Some um, tough questions there. Yeah, good questions. I don't want to get too far into the submetering except to say, and that was a term, submetering. So what you're talking about is metering within the building, individual suites. Um, and it's absolutely an issue. What's um, What's unfortunate is we actually need a conversation about it because there's some more creative ways of dealing with it. Um, one of the most obvious solutions is you just meter everything. The problem with heating is it's very expensive to meter. So if you look at the cost of the meter relative to what you're metering, um, it'll make you feel good because your neighbor's now being charged. But the reality is that we've now paid more for that meter than all the heat that will be metered by it for the next 10 to 15 years. But the good news is there's really innovative, creative ways of solving that problem. There's two main uses of heat in suites. Domestic hot water, which you use for all your showers, uh, wash, and all that. That actually has more control. Like People can control that a lot more because how long do I take a shower? How often do I take a shower? But you know how full my loads are and all those kinds of things. Um, that's what we call elastic. People can control that. Well, domestic hot water is actually cheaper to meter. It, you just need a flow meter. We don't need an energy meter. You just meter the flow. So in fact, what I find ironic is a lot of developers jump to we need full suite metering when paradoxically there's a really cheap interim solution, which actually looks a little bit similar in terms of the amount of energy metered as the base case with uh, electric baseboards. But the other examples are for your, your issue is sometimes just Technology. So an example is UBC has a student residence where when a window is open, the heat can't be on. You have choice, but that's not one of your choices. <laughs> so, so and in a way, a lot of people say, well, that takes away my choice. I'd like to have the window open and the heat on. Fair enough. But the reality is a lot of actually people would just prefer not to have to think about it. And it's in modern buildings, that's not a hard thing. Now, retrofit's different. But in a modern building, we can design that from the get-go. It's an elegant solution. When you think about it, they can't change their facade. They can't change their windows. They're in, so what else can they do? Well, that's a very simple one. We don't need an expensive meter. And then your last question, and sorry, I'll turn it over, is just that's, that's one of the roles of the BCUC. They are there looking at is the economic case and the public interest. And that's a whole other conversation. But uh, I think British Columbia is very ahead in terms of the use of the regulator in this space. So does that help? Yes. Hi. Sorry, did you have? Yeah, uh, I'll just reiterate that you said um, we did one project where we looked at the adding uh, energy meters on, and it would have increased the total cost of the system by 15%. And like that's, that's just a massive increase just to get the metering in. So with, when it comes to metering heat, it, it really is a challenge. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can build based on by square footage and that kind of stuff. It, it won't tie directly to how people are using it, but there, there are other options if you have one meter. Um, and then, yeah, with the, the regulation, um, yeah, BCUC uh, monitors a lot of this. Uh, you know, you can't choose your gas provider, you can't choose your electricity provider either. Um, and they make sure that it still is a net benefit to, have, to not have that choice. And there are some district energy systems, like uh, uh, for a long time, uh, uh, Central Steam, it was all optional. You had the choice to, to, 
to, a, to, to um, sorry, hook up to it. It wasn't, wasn't ever mandatory. So there, there are some options where you know, district energy can provide a really competitive thing and it's, a, it's an option to connect as well. Okay, so I've got a number of other questions. I just want to acknowledge we have Councillor Reimer in the room. Thank you for joining us today. Are there any other elected officials that I've missed? Okay, great. So we've got one. Can you put up your hands, those of you that had questions? So one, two, and three. And I'll just run up with the mic so that you're on webcast. Thank you. So this is about t carbon, I guess, the talks. And I just want to get you back to the very basic of what is it that, are you, that you are displacing through the projects that you've done in Vancouver so far? Is it gas-fired? Um, do you want to ask for that? Uh, yeah, I mean, looking at the base case is always challenging. If you're in a retrofit, it's, it's a little bit more obvious. So we were displacing central steam when we went to the geo energy recovery project. So that had a very quantifiable carbon amount, which we've done on that. Um, what is the fuel? What fuel are you displacing? What's the fuel you're not, displacing? Not oh, it's, it's natural gas fired boilers that fire the steam plant. And then we are running more electricity um, that goes in there. But the electricity in this province has a lower carbon impact than the gas. Uh, everything that we've looked at is based on heat pump technology. So there is always an electricity input into it um, in, in that regard. Uh, you know, we look at air source heat pumps. We'll look at lots of different ones. I mean, we originally came out of a geo end of things, so that's why we looked a lot at geo technology. But um, really what we like to see is flexibility in the designs of the district energy system so they can work with whatever new energy sources that might come along. If I could just follow up to, like, the, you have to think of district energy as a network and something that supplies it. So it's like electricity. The electric network is the same regardless of what's going into it. And with district energy, there's some variations, but it's a platform that enables us to use a whole variety of technologies. They're not, to and I can show you charts, like in Sweden, they've had massive technological transformations from 100% oil to a variety of biofuels to heat pumps to industrial waste heat. It's always context specific, and if we can internalize carbon in the business case, we're looking for the least cost way in that application to reduce carbon. And the examples, you know, Southeast Falls Creek does sewer heat recovery, uh, waste heat from industry, bioenergy, um, all the heat pump technologies, they do use electricity, but they use, you know, a third of the amount of electricity as just conventional resistance. And we still use a little bit of gas because that's the cheapest way for all this peaking and, and backup. So does that kind of answer it? Okay. Um, I have a question about the complementary loads. So um, I am just guessing or assuming that most building needs heating in the winter and cooling in the summer. So other than large data centers, um, how do complementary loads work? And then uh, my second question is related to Michael's question. Um, can you like regulate a user, end user, to just use between, I don't know, 18 degrees to like 22 degrees to set their thermostat to have a regulated kind of temperature? Like, has that been ever discussed? Um, so with low profiles, if you have a different type of, like very basic, if you have a different occupancy, you're gonna have a different lower profile. Um, so if you have a residential, you're, you know, and you're in a shoulder season, you're, it's kind of, you know, not super hot, not super cold. Um, that residential building is probably going to need heat, but your office building will probably need cooling because it has all the people in it and all the uh, computers and all the equipment in there, the lights adding heat. So uh, when we look at load profiles, we'll look at hourly loads. So every hour of the day, and you can, uh, you know, you can figure out what they are either through metering or through uh, simulation, what that's going to be. And, um, you know, you can plug in different parts. Sometimes in, in the same building, you'll have different low profiles. One of the buildings at Solo is um, it's residential on top, uh, office in the middle, and retail on the bottom. And they're all going to be occupied at different times of the day, and they're going to have different, different loads along those lines. So it's typically based on, um, you know, how, it, how it's, what the occupancy is, but then also how the building itself was designed, what the mechanical system is, and what the building envelopes, right? If you have a really good envelope, you might have a building that's, uh, you know, at the right temperature or maybe needs cooling, and if it has a really poor envelope, it might need heating because um, of what temperature is going on outside, the position of the sun, and, and lots of factors. Yeah, the example you used was a seasonal one, so summer versus winter. And another good example is like hospitals have a fairly continuous year-round 
hot water load. So you put them on a system and you start to see some impact. But um, one of the rules of thumb in this region, and it's consistent everywhere, like if a university <coughs> builds a district system, if you built building by building and you added up all the boiler capacity, let's just use that as an example, that total that you would need would exceed the amount in a central plant where you share it by more than 15%. And it's what we call low diversification. Even if it's the same type of building, they're just, they don't behave in the same way. So the amount of capacity you have to install, we often reduce it by 15% when you centralize. Then you get mixed use, then you get seasonal loads, and you can actually even make that better. But that is, that is clearly one of the, the ones. I'll just answer your last question about um, can you constrain people? It's really funny, my parents live in a strata that uh, has hydronic system, and one person at the very end wants really, really warm, like it's like going in their tropics. And they can't because the system won't get above a certain temperature. That's just the reality of how it was designed. So you can definitely design it so there are some limits, but I think you're getting into an era of like you can be overly prescriptive and people don't like, so, so there's, hydronic systems have limits. You can't have a tropical, <laughs> greenhouse in your apartment, but you can't probably restrain it that much without getting into questions of paternalism and that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Question over here. Um, just had a question if you could comment on the differences in the role of the regulator like BCUC between public utilities and private utilities, and then maybe some context in terms of what the trends are like that you've seen in Europe or in the, in the U.S. in terms of in terms of the private sector developing more of the district energy systems? It's probably more of the valley. <laughs> <laughs> <You> sure. <laughs> um, well, first of all, we are a bit unique. Um, every jurisdiction in the world has a public utilities regulator. Um, it, its role varies a bit. And really, public utilities regulators were developed because we wanted the private sector to de deliver these public utilities, but they're monopolies, so we needed a regulator. That's really how it evolved. Um, in jurisdictions where they were publicly owned, they sometimes just didn't have that step. They just assumed that through election and governance that it was effectively a regulator. BC is unique because our public utilities regulator actually regulates BC Hydro, which is publicly owned. You can, you can quibble about whether they really regulate them, but anyway, they do, and that's looked as a model. Uh, Quebec replicated it, for example. So um, I'm a big believer in checks and balances, and that's an example of a check and balance. But when you get to the private sector, you definitely need independent oversight. In the case of creative energy, there's actually two forms of oversight. There's a franchise agreement with the city, which has certain requirements and issues, and then there's the role of the BCUC, which is more an economic regulator. It's a great model, and it's so great that cities like Vancouver and most recently Surrey, who have set up their own district energy systems, they've actually emulated it, so they're exempt under legislation, but they've emulated it with their own independent rate review panels. So they still regulate it by council, but they've, they've added this extra bit of oversight and, and look at it, and you bring professionals in. And I'm, I think that's an awesome model, and I think it's a testament to how well some of that oversight works in the province. Does that answer your question? Okay. So I've got, I've got, I've got a question. I'm gonna, I've got Mark that's going to ask a question, and then I have a question for each of you. What's the question you really want to ask Hart? And Hart, what's the question you want to ask Trent? Okay, just to get things going here. And I've got Mark, and then we're <laughs> going to come back to you. I, I'm, I'm curious more on the, uh, the economics of the 777 uh, Dunsmuir project, because you built this geo-exchange system, um, but you, like, like, why does that make economic sense, given the, uh, the cost of doing that, when you can basically connect to the existing district heating system, you know, which has, like, all these amortized costs and all that? So how, what was the kind of decision-making process around that? Like, how does this make economic sense? Um... I mean, it still had a reasonable payback on it. It just didn't have a three-year payback. And basically, when we worked with Cadillac Fairview, they were open to going beyond their typical three, four, five-year payback because of the type of project it was. And the reason they pushed it back beyond that is because of say, you know, some of the points I mentioned above. And, and they really do want to push 
as push the envelope, you know? Like, there was, we, we approached a lot of people, and nobody wanted to be the first one to do this. This has never been done in this way before. And, and they, they, they realize that if they really want to push the envelope, they have to, you know, take a little bit more risk and, and be a little bit more open. Now, the, the project did not have a 25-year payback. Um, the equipment doesn't last that long, some of it, and it would have never made any sense. But because of those other, um, those other, you know, basically there was a willingness on their end. It's kind of the leadership that, that he was talking about. They, they wanted to do a project. And because they wanted to do a project, we were able to, to, to work on, you know, different financial metrics that would work for them. So it was still a reasonable payback. It just wasn't, you know, super short, like, say, changing out a light bulb. Okay, so Trent, what's your question for Hurt? Well, actually, I'm going to ask a follow-up question because I, I like that one. But I'm curious because I see a lot of business cases. So um, in this province, we've had hydro rates, rightly, it just is the reality of costs rising, you know, 10, 15, 30 percent in the last few years and, and, and committed and projected to rise more. And in fact, even at those levels, they're under-recovering. So in your business case, when you're looking at the economics, what did you assume for future electricity prices? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we started this project a few years ago when electricity prices were very different. Sorry right? for the tough question. No, no, it's, no it, is, it is a good one. Um, before they finally decided to pull the trigger, the rate increases were announced. So all of our economics got rerun with the higher utility rates on, on electricity and also some of the costs from central steam had been going up as well. So all of those numbers got rerun again and they were you know, still in the same same area. There was, a, there was a lot of actual different updates that went to that. Um, you know, the uh, cost of carbon is, a, you know, we had some carbon allowances in there and we had to, you know, update and change a lot of those. Um, we do a sensitivity analysis based on different utility rates mm -hmm. when we do in, uh, we, we, we have a couple different economic models, but the simple payback one, we, we ran it with a lot of different, um, different utility rates so that they get an idea of the risk that they were taking. I'm worried now because now I asked you, you're my worried. question you first. Asked, you asked your, okay, Hart, yeah. <laughs> this is your chance. Something challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the big question to me is if you actually, like, how long do you think it will take to get <clears throat> central steam to, like, a low-carbon solution? Or, like, you know, do you really feel that we're going to be able to push that way? And, like, what kind of realistic time frame? Because it's such a huge undertaking. It's not like a year-long project. It just, it isn't, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. To kind of get a feel for your perspective on that. Yeah, 2020. Um, <laughs> um, no, that is, that is the working uh, hypothesis. But, you know, I, that's a great question, and I really appreciate it. Because if you look at all of the largest cities, so I was just in you know, Berlin and Munich and Hamburg. If you look at those cities where, why do we live in cities? Shared infrastructure, big projects. That's just a reality. And all of them have major commitments for massive reductions in carbon. Munich has a commitment to 100% renewables and zero carbon by 2050. And the only way they can achieve that in the dense core is through these district systems that they've already implemented. And now they're going through the next wave, which is to decarbonize them. So the good news is that Creative actually created the network and aggregated these 200 buildings, which is a massive opportunity. Because if they were 200 separate buildings, we would not be having this conversation. The next phase is how do we decarbonize the heat source? The good news is it's a old system with a, an old plan, so we're at, an, we're at the decision point. And um, yeah, I would say the, the plan is in the next four to six years, um, actively searching for those opportunities. And it'll be a mix of large as well as some smaller systems, which is what all the Europeans are doing. Does that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the thing that's very. You can hold to me, me to I, that, right? Well, there's not. Gonna, well, there's not <laughs> I know that you don't have the solution if we had the solution. <laughs> Apparently, right? maybe. I, I think we no. spice things up there. <laughs> so we have a question from Twitter. So this question comes from Vancouver Community College. Um, they're asking, for those of us on an old creative energy central heat system, how can we work together to reduce our GHGs? Uh, great question. Well, there's some things that the buildings do themselves, right? All that creative does is like hydro, it delivers the energy. The buildings themselves are responsible for how they use that energy. So a lot of the older buildings can undergo retrofits and efficiency improvements and utilize the energy better. And creative's actually working on programs to actually help with that process. Um, and then as customers, here's the tension. Regulated, um, you've got customers who want the least cost. If they don't have to pay for carbon, they're not going to pay a premium to decarbonize. And we've got other customers who want 
low carbon. So we have to work together on a conversation about how we manage those two conundrums, right? The, the ones who just want the lowest rate and will go to the BCUC and say this, it's gas, forget it, and others who really want to see the green. And that's a conversation we still need to have. I keep wondering if the BCUC wants to have any say on this. So we've got <laughs> one, two, and three. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's my understanding that uh, I think in Surrey, you ha the developer has to pay into the district energy system and put down a large capital cost to be involved in it, um, which then squeezes out uh, potentially other renewable choices in the future. Is, is that true that they have to uh, invest in it a, a large sum up front and be part of the district energy system no matter what? And then I'm wondering uh, uh, if that then starts squeezing out other choices for building solutions that might be more uh, energy efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you might have an insight on this, but I'll just say that uh, mandatory connection, that's true. Uh, they don't have to make a direct contribution to the system. There might be a small connection fee, and I, I, the caveat is I haven't seen the last set of rates that went, but I'm pretty sure there is no major contribution. I think what you're talking about is that they have to design their buildings in such a way that's compatible, and that can, depending on the kind of development, have an upfront cost to the developer. But that's not, they're not contributing to the system, uh, so that's the first thing. Your second part of your question is really interesting, and this is what I mean by competition. Let's just take it out of the realm of district energy for a second. If I'm building a flood protection system for a city and I want to let developers opt in and out, it's a massive flood protection system. It's a big dike system. We need to pay for it. And it has a public benefit. Um, do I let individual developments then at that point go, no, I'm going to build my buildings on stilts and all that, opt out of the system? Well, that's kind of the conversation. It's, it's collective infrastructure. Either we're in or we're out. And the second thing is that a lot of these systems are sunk. So even the strata, once they put in a geo field, the next year they're not going to go and implement a solar hot water, well, most stratas, maybe. <laughs> but, but it's because it's sunk. It's a sunk cost. Why would they economically go and then put in a solar heating system on top? Because they're still paying back the capital. Well, why is that any different at the district level? We're paying back the capital for a renewable, a good system. And then we say, but I don't want, I want to be able to implement a solar. Well, you wouldn't do it in your own building. Why would we do it at a district scale? So if we want distributed building by building systems, we should have that conversation and then go that way. But you can't have both. You can't, you know, within limits. Either you're going to go big, you're going to go deep, and you're going to go collect a solution, or you're going to go distributed systems and really push on them. That's, do you have a... Yeah, I mean, I think you, you were right there. The, the added cost would be having to switch, switch from electric baseboards to hydronic systems. So it's not like they're, they're paying into it. They just have to build a building that's more expensive. Um, but on the flip side, sometimes in district energy, you can build a building that's less expensive connecting. Um, you know, if you connect to central steam, you don't have to put in a boiler plant. You've got to save all that cost. Um, you know, what you do is you pay for it in a longer picture. So it doesn't necessarily cost more or less to connect to a district energy. It really depends on what your, your baseline is. And your baseline for a developer is electric baseboards, right? Um, so that's with the connection. What was the second half of your question? We're just squeezing no. out other choices. Ah, uh, yeah. I do appreciate the flood example, but yeah. that's with I mean, with innovation. We got two more questions. Yeah, with the mandatory yes. connection. Um, you need that to kind of leverage the, the the system, right? But we've also seen that in some in some. Uh, some projects, uh, you know, there's theoretically maybe a district energy system 15 years down the road, and we can't build a, a building that has a more efficient mechanical system. So I, I've seen sometimes it does go too far. You definitely need to have, and especially if there is a, a, a real, there is, there is going to be a district energy system there, and it's going to be, you know, really cost effective, and it's going to be low carbon, or whatever your drivers are, it totally makes sense. But we have seen the flip side where it's, you're not going to have anything there for 15 years, and that's almost a life cycle on the, on the mechanical system or you know, that's the bulk of the life cycle in the mechanical system, depending on what you put in. So there's, um, we do see sometimes that it's, it's, a, it's a little strict, and that's where we would like to see a little bit more flexibility. But you definitely do um, need to be able to have people connect onto different district energy systems to make them viable. And there's a lot of really good economic and environmental benefits of district energy. Great. We're going to make a short question. Sure. Uh, I have a, just a quick question, just looking south to Seattle and their efforts uh, with their steam district energy system. And they've, I think they've got a, a biomass plant and 
possibly also considering a combined heat and power plant um, as far as ways to decarbonize. I'm wondering if how what can we learn from from the what's happened in Seattle and and where they're going as far as a nearby example. Yeah, it's one of the models we're looking to. Um, I've worked on that system in Seattle and with the city and. Um, it's a great example where rather than fully abandoning infrastructure, we try to adapt and modernize it. So if you look at Copenhagen and Berlin and those things, they built the networks and now rather than abandoning them, they're looking at how we decarbonize them and leverage them. So um, yeah, we're looking and we're trying to learn a lot from those initiatives in Seattle. In fact, we're in active conversations about what they've learned and what the issues are. Does that get at your question? or? Yeah, sort of, I, I, you want to know a specific thing they can learn? <laughs> no, just uh, on capacity as far as uh, the, the speed of which they're... Yeah, they're they did the biomass project in a couple of years, and it was a 50% reduction in carbon. And, and their system's a little bit smaller than central heat, uh, creative energy, so uh, that was an overnight. So that's an example, leveraging. UBC built their bioenergy plant, 6 megawatts. Um, you know, it's a pretty significant contribution to their load overnight, so they can have big impact and they're doable. Uh, not specifically in a BC context, but in North America, how are the established utilities responding to, to DE and its, its burgeoning market space? So what, I missed the question. Uh, North American markets and how the established utilities, the incumbents that are already in place and have been so for a long time, how are they responding to, to this new approach to, uh, in essence, taking over or encroaching on their market share? Uh, I mean, it's just one approach, and it, it, it doesn't work everywhere. Um, I mean, with central steam, uh, we were able to come to a solution where both, both systems can work together. Um, and I think that's just part of collaborating and, and working towards a, a solution. I mean, I don't think we should restrict a certain option or certain technology that's providing a really good benefit, and if, you know, economically, environmentally, um, you know, for the sake of, uh, you know, maintaining uh, the status quo, right? Um, so I think we definitely had to, we had to, had to push with that, but uh, in the end, we found them receptive and we were able to, to negotiate a deal. I mean, this is the, this is the first project where we have where there's basically going to be kind of two options working there. Um, and that's the only concrete example we have, and we were able to find it. But it was, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussions. And, and, you know, the existing contracts were between Cadillac Fairview and Central Steam. So, uh, you know, Cadillac Fairview is ultimately engaging this, pot, this, uh, this project. So they had to, you know, they, they rewrote a contract over it. So there was, you know, a lot of different new terms and items and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but they were able to get to a solution. So Great. Did you want to add anything, Trent? Well, just that it varies, and we have to remember, actually, District Energy has been around for a long time, and the first systems were developed by electric utilities. Most people don't realize that the way we got electricity globally is because they were able to capture the waste heat and use it. Otherwise, we would have had trouble building those systems. That's how District Energy got started. So you look at Pittsburgh and, and Pennsylvania and, and New York City and all of those systems that are there, they're actually 100 years old. And they started with the electric utilities. The electric utilities spun them out. Then they forget, and now they're kind of competing. But um, gas, sometimes they want to own and operate them because the writing's on the wall that gas is important, but they need other grids. So you look at Fortis's foray into district energy here, um, and that's being replicated elsewhere. So it's, it's mixed. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I don't know what else to say. I don't know, it's like uh, Apple coming out with the iPhone. Basically, they, the iPod went away because of it, but they knew that's the way it was going, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of utilities will, uh, you know, they have to embrace new technology, and whether that's just central steam moving away from boiler plants to biomass, um, you know, they, they will have to kind of change and evolve. And I think, you know, that's just the nature of any business. I think that's a really big question that may be a subject for another Carbon Talk. I want to thank everybody for being here. And I know there's some people that didn't get their questions answered, but there's a, hopefully a chance that you can connect with Trent and Hart. Thank you. you the, the two of you have such depth of knowledge here, and it's been fascinating just listening to you uh, talk. So really appreciate it. Thanks to PIX, to those of you in the web world, and to North Growth Foundation, and of course to the Center for Dialogue and Carbon Talks. Um, we'll see you at every month we try to host one. The next one will be in January. We're going to take some time off in December. So look forward to seeing you then. Take care.